When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. If I had one criticism of financial experts, I think it would be that they don't spend enough time talking about the importance of the money story. I try to do that a lot on this podcast. You might even be tired of hearing me talk about the money story, but it's so important if you think about our stories, not just our money story, but our career story, our family stories, all the different stories of the people that we come in contact with. I'm wondering, do we spend enough time talking about stories? Do we spend enough time getting to know people? Do we spend enough time understanding what other people have been through? I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. And today we're talking Everybody Has a Story with Lily Clayton Hansen and Ask Shauna. Millennial Money with Shauna Compton Game. It will expand your brain. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. So the Ask Shauna question today comes from Bill and Melissa. And they wrote in and said they've been longtime listeners of the podcast. And they're starting to think that they'd like to hire a financial planner. They wrote, Dear Shauna, We are going through a lot of life changes, and we kind of think it might be a good idea to find a CFP or some financial professional to work with. However, we have absolutely no idea where to start, how to find somebody, the questions to ask, or what we should do. Can you please help us? We desperately need your advice. That's such a great question. I think I have received so many emails, particularly in the last couple of months from you, 
about finding a CFP or finding a financial expert, lots of different variations of this question. And so I thought, okay, this probably would make it a good time to start talking about this with you. And unfortunately, I wish I had some really good response for you about how you can find a CFP, how you can vet one out. There are some places that you can go to. One of the best is the CFP board website. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes. I'm going to put a link directly to the page where you can go in, you can enter your zip code, and then you can find a list of the CFP pros in your particular area. Now, I will say there is definitely a caveat that a lot of the CFPs now work a virtual planning model. So you could have your financial expert could live in Texas and you could live in Colorado and you never see each other except virtually. And that's kind of the way the business is going these days. It's definitely the business model that is super, super popular. But if you still prefer to see someone face to face, then you could definitely use this website to find somebody local where you can meet with them face to face over a cup of coffee or whatever you prefer and, you know, have them work with you on their finances. Now, I've also received a lot of questions about the different payment structures of CFPs. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to be wildly different and there actually isn't a central norm. Most CFPs, they come up with some sort of hourly rate, but most don't actually bill by the hour. So usually they'll have some sort of system where, and this is really popular these days, where you'll pay a certain amount up front, usually somewhere between 1000 and 3000 That's pretty much the range that I have seen lately, where you'll actually get a financial plan and then you'll pay like a monthly retainer amount to the CFP so that they can monitor everything that's going on with your finances. They can keep up with any changes, stay on top of things. So that model is really, really popular. Now, with that said, there are a lot of CFPs out there who do offer kind of like a quick start package where maybe it's a couple hundred bucks and you either meet with them virtually or face-to-face for anywhere between an hour or two, three hours, somewhere in that range. And you're usually focusing on one to three particular financial objectives that you're trying to achieve. That's great if you're going through a life change like you're getting married, maybe you're starting a family, or maybe you just want some guidance. You know, what what funds should you pick in your 401k? Or you're thinking of starting a business, what should you be thinking about? You know, questions like that that are really specific and particular to your situation. I find those quick start sessions or whatever that particular CFP calls them can be very valuable, particularly if you don't have a huge amount of money to invest working with a financial planner, invest. By invest, I mean actually pay them. Um, And, you know, every CFP is going to have a different model of the services they offer and the prices that they charge to correlate with that. And so while it could be a giant pain in the ass, going through the list on the CFP board website, depending on where you live, if you live in a smaller city, that list is not going to be quite as exhaustive. If you live in a big city, There could be a lot of people on that list for you to vet through, but it's worth vetting through. And I would say, you know, if you're, if you're looking on that website, CFPs, we are, in order to have that designation, we're held to a higher ethical standard versus somebody who just calls themselves a financial planner. Not only did we have to go through super rigorous coursework in order to actually get those three initials behind our name. But every year we have to uh, kind of recertify. We have these these obligations to keep those those three letters that require us to be ethical, um, that require us to always put a customer, your needs, I should say, ahead of whatever the CFP pro is thinking might be the best thing that you should do. And that's just another word for a word you might have heard called a fiduciary. That's kind of a big buzzword in the industry these days. So, you know, a CFP is just held to that standard. Does that mean that they are any better or worse than a person who just calls themselves a financial planner? I don't know. That's for you to decide. That's not for me to decide. Certainly when I got my CFP marks, 
uh, it was something for me that I was really passionate about because it was a, it was kind of like the highest echelon for a financial planner. There aren't that many of us. There's somewhere between 70 and 80,000 of us in the US, which out of all the financial planners, that isn't a lot. And those of us 40 and under is a much smaller margin. Um, Certainly the financial planning field is littered with people that are, sorry guys, that are 50 plus and are male. And really I would kind of skew that probably like 60 plus. So there's a, you know, real interesting, we don't have to get into all that, but it's really interesting to see what is going to happen with the financial planning field. Um, You know, another thing you can do is ask your friends, ask people that you trust, hey, have you worked with a financial planner? Did you like them? Did you not like them? And, you know, quite honestly, I I don't want to, I don't want to put this out there as as a negative or a deterrent for you to hiring a CFP to work with. But there are so many companies now, so many apps, different things that we've talked about on this podcast that you can use where you can almost put together your own financial plan in a way. Now, do I think there are some times where, yes, it makes total sense to hire a CFP? Absolutely. Like I said, those big milestones that you're going through, those are big deals. And a lot of times having somebody else's eyes on your situation makes a big difference. We can see things that you just can't see because we do this all the time. We look at other people's money. We look at other people's bank statements. We look at other people's investments. We look at the risks that other people are exposed to, and that's the job. It's to see in between the lines. And so, you know, it's easy for you to maybe miss something. Certainly with investing, if you have no idea what you're doing, maybe it's a good idea to hire a, you know, CFP for a quick start session or something like that, even just to give you a basis of information so you feel a little bit more educated. But it's not for everyone. And like I said, there are so many tools out there that you can use that are making financial planning affordable. And, you know, I think those are great resources. I really try on this podcast to bring you a lot of those different ideas and opinions and things to think about, hoping that maybe something in there would resonate with you or would be able to help your particular situation. But when you're hiring a CFP, I mean, you're really just looking for like, I tell people, like, find somebody that you would want to hang out with. Find somebody that you feel like there's a level of trust because you're obviously going to have to expose all your finances to this person and that it's somebody that you maybe have a good rapport with, that you feel like maybe there's something symbiotic between you two or it just feels good. I mean, you know what I mean. You know when you meet someone and you're like, oh, I think we're going to become friends and other people, you're like, I don't. I don't really think we don't have anything in common. I don't think we're going to become friends. It's the same thing. You know, find someone that you really feel like you can resonate with, that you can be honest with, that you don't mind sharing your finances with, and somebody that you feel knows what they're doing. You know, you can ask a CFP before you hire them, hey, like, what does your typical client look like? And although we can't tell you the clients we work with, um, one of the rules of being a CFP is that we have to steer away from testimonies. So, you know, we can't say, okay, here's, you know, five people and they're going to give me glowing reviews. I want you to contact them. But you can get a good sense online, social media, by talking to people, um, uh, even just by interactions with the CFP. Most of them do free either 15 or 30 minute phone calls with you initially. And I mean, this isn't, this isn't uh, rocket science. You know, if you feel like you can connect with someone. So I say interview two to three people and, you know, don't just go with the first person. Talk to a couple of different people until you feel like you have someone that will really be able to meet your needs and maybe that you can grow with. But that's such a great question, Bill and Melissa. I'm so happy that you sent that question. Like I said, I've received a lot of questions kind of in this same vein It's super frustrating to me that there isn't a better way for you to find a financial planner that would meet your needs. Um, Because I, I, you know, in in my own research, trying to connect different people that have emailed uh, into me, you know, I always try and find some matches for you if you email me and you're looking for a CFP because I want to make sure that you, you find someone that you really like that you trust and that, you know, is going to be a great fit for you. So 
Again, I'll put the link in the show notes. If you're looking for someone, the CFP board website is probably the best place to go. You can always Google CFP in your zip code or in your particular city. Uh, But just do your research on someone. You know, before you hand someone a thousand plus dollars, do a little research on them. Make sure that it's a good fit. And that's about the best advice I can give you. I'm so excited to have this conversation with our podcast episode guest today. Lily has been a podcast episode guest before, and her episode was one of my very favorite episodes, and she said she actually got a lot of input and traction from you as a listener, and and I love when that happens, because that means, like, this actually works. And her first book was called Word of Mouth. Uh, She lives in Nashville, and she really wanted to get back to the art of conversation, talking about people's stories, finding people who had these interesting stories where their business grew by word of mouth, which I really feel is kind of a lost art. I mean, it's how I've grown everything in my career. It's really how we've grown the podcast. We haven't had really fancy PR. I haven't hired anybody to splash millennial money around. It's really just been through you and you sharing the podcast with your friends and your family and it just kind of growing organically. And so She wanted to have another book. She wanted to continue the conversation, and she's just come out with her new book, Word of Mouth, More Conversations, and I really feel this is such the right time to be talking about this topic, to be talking about the fact that we all have a story and that all of our stories are really important, you know, in the light of all the suicides that have been happening lately and just the conversation that's been going on about people's mental health. Um, I know I shared on Instagram a couple of weeks ago that I've had my own battle the last couple of years with depression and anxiety, certainly something that I never walked through in my life before, and it's really hard. It's, I feel like I'm, I'm on the other end of it, but I, I could get tripped up any day, and it's, it's, it's a battle, and it is just like this – fogginess, you know, it, it's indescribable. I, I really don't have a lot of words to to talk through it. I want to do a podcast episode about that because I feel like there's a real correlation there between money and outlook and career and, you know, all of these different components that, that go into that, that go into, you know, somebody feeling depressed, like legitimately depressed and anxiety ridden. So, I just feel like this is such a great time to have this conversation with Lily. And, you know, we we talk a lot about why does this matter to her? Why does it matter to her to share the conversations? And what I also love is that Lily doesn't have a fancy publisher. She started her own publishing company. She birthed this all out of her own idea of of connecting people, of sharing stories. And it just it just proves to me that you can do whatever you want. You can be fearless. You can find your dream career. You don't have to wait for this big magical door to open. You can open the door and you can walk through it. So before we get to the interview, a quick word from our podcast episode sponsor. One thing I think we can all agree on is that when it comes to our finances, it's never fun paying our monthly phone bill. I don't know about you, but I find the bills confusing and there's always extra costs and charges And I can never actually speak to a human to figure out what's going on. I just looked at our current phone bill from last month in complete horror because we were paying so much more than we were actually using. But luckily, I'm here to tell you about a new company that I think is finally making the phone carrier experience really an easy one while saving you money. It's called Wing. In fact, on Wing's website, I just saw this today, they state that over $37 billion is wasted on unused data per year. Yikes, like that's a lot of money. All right, so what is Wing? Well, Wing is a new digital first phone carrier. It's a phone carrier like Verizon or AT&T, except you're actually going to enjoy dealing with Wing. Wing's average bill is only $35 a month, while most people who haven't joined Wing are paying, you know, usually over $100 a month. I certainly was paying over $100 a month. Plus, Wing uses the exact same cell towers as the major carriers, so you get the same coverage for less with no strings, no hidden fees, all the good stuff. The real perk, though, 
If you don't use all your data in a month, they actually give you money back. So you're never going to pay for data you don't use. You're going to keep your same phone, your same phone number. The setup is quick and easy, so you're not going to be without your service. And they offer family plans, unlimited plans, international data, everything that you need with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And the average person saves 30% on their bill when they switch. I mean, why wouldn't I switch to Wing? Right now, my listeners can get $25 off their first phone bill with Wing when you go to wingalpha.com, click join Wing and enter the promo code MYMONEY. Just go to wingalpha, that's W-I-N-G-A-L-P-H.com and enter the code MYMONEY, all one word. Because it's time to get with a phone carrier that makes sense and start saving up to 30% on your monthly bill. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. 
daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short-form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. You didn't have to come here. So, Lily, I am so excited to have you back on the podcast as a guest for your follow-up book uh, that we're going to talk about today. And um, it's just so exciting. I think uh, anytime we can have a podcast guest back again. Yes, I I know. I was thrilled. And uh, it's funny because actually I've, you know, been on several podcasts and TV shows twice. And I always, I always think it's nice. I mean, I I know my, some of my favorite interviews have been, you know, where I was able to interview people multiple times and it's kind of cool to get to know their journey over the years, you know, as they do different projects. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I think it's really interesting, you know, our world today, not only in the U.S., but, you know, everywhere, it just seems that we're we're more and more divided, we're more isolated, we're, you know, using social media, and, you know, that's a weird thing in itself. You know, why do you think it's so important for us to have these conversations? You're all about having conversations. Why do you think that's even so much more important now today than ever before? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about, you know, the art of conversation. I always joke that it's my favorite artistic medium. And I would say, you know, with my books and my blog and, you know, my art installation at the Nashville International Airport, everything I do, I really just want to encourage people to have more face-to-face conversations. I think, you know, we rely too heavily these days on, you know, email and social media. And while those are great tools to communicate, um, I, I don't think you can ever replace what it's like to communicate with someone face-to-face and ask questions and to learn, you know, about their story and their wisdom and insight. And I just know how deeply it's enriched my own life and made me a much happier person to have so many face-to-face conversations. Um, I would like others to have that same opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, you you have such a diverse background. You've done a lot of things in your career. How did you come up with the idea of like, hey, I want to sit down and I want to have, you know, conversations uh, with all these different people in Nashville and talk about their lives? I mean, had you been thinking about that idea for a while? You know, my background was in journalism. You're right. I have a pretty diverse background. I mean, I've done pretty much every kind of writing um, aside from hard news. Um, I was very fortunate at a young age to be able to experiment a lot. And what I discovered when I was in my early 20s was that I really loved interviews. And similar to when I spent a lot of time last year in London, um, I, I was dating someone there. And so I was very fortunate to be able to spend I would say off and on over five months in the UK last year, um, you know, I wanted to get to know my surroundings and I figured, you know, when I moved to Nashville, I knew very little about Nashville or the South and what better way to understand the city that I was living in than to chat with, you know, the locals or even fellow transplants such as myself. And I think that's such a cool idea because I think what that shows is like, you don't have to write a book about something or or do something big, but you could do this. You could take this idea in your own city and, you know, use it as a mechanism to meet people, to talk to people, maybe even in a field that you're interested in, you know, as a way to connect with people. Absolutely. Um, You know, my last book that I just did, so that would be my third book. um, And it was really the one that, you know, kind of turned 
my whole platform into a business. Um, it, it was for a large organization housed in Nashville. And, you know, it, it was in an industry that I knew virtually nothing about. And it, it was almost kind of comical. I mean, I, I felt like I almost talked them out of hiring me um, because <laughs> I said, hey, you know, I, I'm so happy that you're such big fans of my brand. And I'm so flattered by it. I, I know like literally nothing about your industry. And they laughed and they said that that's perfect because, you know, your objective and I thought, well, that's a really interesting idea because I am. Um, and so I think that, yes, I mean, coming in from an objective viewpoint, like I knew nothing about Nashville when I moved there. Um, I, I knew I knew a little bit more about London because, you know, I'm very into literature and I knew some about British history. Um, but there is something about going into a city or an industry um, or even a conversation with a human being and having very little context and really being able to see it for what it is. I think it's a really beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and your books focus on um, word of mouth and this follow-up book, More Conversations, Word of Mouth, More Conversations. It focuses on, you know, what is arguably one of the hottest cities and, you know, your adopted hometown, Nashville. I would love to get your thoughts because you're actually in Nashville. You know, what is going on there? Like, why is this becoming one of the hottest cities. Why are, you know, I think the statistic is like 100 people are moving there a day. Like what is so special? What's in the water there that's just attracting people? Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to put it. There, There is something very magical about Nashville. You know, it, it was interesting because before, as I mentioned, I, I knew virtually very little about the city before I moved here. I moved here with an old boyfriend who's still one of my best friends. And, you know, uh, the second we arrived here, we said there's something very special about the community. And, you know, I think it's it's vibrancy. Um, the South is known to be very welcoming and friendly, which certainly helps when you're moving to a new place. And, you know, you, you know, no one such as I did when I arrived. But I also think it's a city that was in a state of transition. Um, you know, as I, as I kind of joke, it was, you know, kind of in its renaissance period. So it was changing very quickly. And that can be a really positive thing, especially when you're introducing something new like I was, which, you know, is these open, honest conversations um, in a part of the country that's known to keeping conversation to a more surface level. I feel like people were more receptive of it because the culture was in such a state of transition, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And like, why do you think people are, are moving there in, in droves? Do you think it because this kind of entrepreneurial spirit, this kind of, you know, you can be who you want to be there, where maybe you even in big cities, maybe you might not be able to have that? I think so. Um, you know, I mean, there is a really strong small business community here and artistic community. I mean, you know, my, uh, my building is a great example. I've lived at the Ryman Artist Lofts, you know, which is government subsidized for the last, you know, almost five years. And I think my building is one of the most amazing places in the city. I mean, it's, you know, 70, I think 75 units of all artists. So, I mean, you know, painters, dancers, musicians, um, you know, and really there are pockets like that scattered throughout Nashville. Um, and, I think when you're in a city where there's so many small business owners and there's something about the community here where everyone is very supportive of one another and I think interested in what other people are doing, that's not only stimulating, but it's encouraging. I mean, you know, I, I think, I mean, from my own personal experience, I mean, it's very scary starting your own business. I know I felt, you know, a lot of fear and I, you know, continue to, I mean, every once in a while. And so to have that sort of support system is just, it, it's invaluable. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, starting your own business. And I mean, I, I certainly have had some of those fear, panic, freak out moments. Um, you know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur since I was in college. So I sort of feel like, you know, I don't really know anything much different other than, you know, kind of the the triumph and struggle that comes along with being an entrepreneur. But, you know, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is thinking about going down that road, but, you know, it just isn't quite sure. And maybe they have a good idea, but they're just not sure how, like, how do they actually bring that into fruition? I would say for me, one thing that was invaluable was taking classes. You know, I'm a huge 
learn as you go kind of person. Um, and so, you know, I was always reading about business and asking friends questions, but there was something about signing up for, I've taken several classes at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center, which has been instrumental in my own success. And there was something about going someplace once a week. You know, right now I'm actually enrolled in one of their classes called pre-flight and it's wonderful. It's an hour and a half every Monday for 14 weeks. And not only to be able to learn there, but to have a community. Um, you know, they assigned me a wonderful mentor in addition to the curriculum uh, named Jeremy Wilkinson. And, you know, I mean, basically he's <laughs> kind of mine for the summer. So I'm totally taking advantage <laughs> of it and emailing him, you know, pretty much 10 times a day. Um, but it's just it's wonderful, you know, to have someone that you can lean on who's had, you know, success in their own industry and maybe they're a little bit more solid in their self-confidence um, and to have that kind of community and also knowledge um, has been wonderful. So I, I would say, yeah, I mean, enroll in a class. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Classes are, are totally underrated too. I mean, I think even just, you know, you, you think of class, you think like, oh my God, I'm going back to college. But really when it's something that you're passionate about, you know, and it, especially like you said, when you have a mentor, like that's so invaluable. Um, so what would you say, kind of before we dive more into the book, what would you say are maybe some of the the money lessons that you've learned? Like if there's any you could pick out that, uh, you know, basically starting a, your own publishing house, you know, bringing these these books to fruition, are there, are there anything that stick out to you? Like, wow, I, I would do that again, or that was a tough one, but I, I learned, you know, through X experience. I would say find a great accountant. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I mean, <laughs> seriously, it's so, I mean, I always joke, I can barely add, honestly. And, you know, I never was good at math. I never was interested in it. And, you know, I think I felt some shame about this growing up. Now I really don't care. Um, I met the most amazing accountant named Melissa through a really incredible organization that I've been a member of for the last five years called the Volunteer Lawyers professional association. And so they basically write all of my contracts. You know, they've helped me with several, you know, legal situations. They're incredible. Um, and, and so they introduced me to Melissa and she's helped me set up my entire business. I mean, I knew virtually nothing about, you know, sales tax and wholesale licenses and all of the stuff. And so I would encourage people to ask for help. Um, you know, I think that's something I, really was not very good at. I've always been very independent and, you know, like to do stuff on my own. Um, but at a certain point, I had to realize I couldn't do everything. Otherwise, I would go batshit crazy. Um, and I certainly <laughs> I, I knew, you know, nothing about accounting or any of the stuff that I mentioned before. And, and how could I? So I, I would tell entrepreneurial people not only to ask for help but cut yourself some slack i mean no one knows everything that is such a great piece of advice because it's true because you, you you try to think that you can do it all and you can't you know and it's so worth like hiring those people that can that can add that can you know do the contracts and um you know just make sure you're covered Definitely who can add for sure. Yeah. I mean, even if it's like an invoice or something, I'll like text her and be like, can you please like double check the sales tax? Because I definitely don't trust my multiplication skills either. That's great. I love that. So, you know, when you wrote the first book, did you have any idea that you were going to do, you know, word of mouth, uh, you know, uh, like a follow up to it? Or were you just kind of you got the first book out and then you thought, you know what, there's more stories to tell? That was exactly the mentality. I mean, you know, it, it's funny. I when we first started the project, I mean, literally everyone's reaction, aside from a few people, um, probably my family, you know, was another book on Nashville. I mean, and I think the reaction was the first book that I did um, w was very well received. And so, you know, it was kind of like, how can you top that? Um, and also. I think that people naturally assumed that I would move on to other cities, which I did. You know, I did a really great interview series in London last year. I've done interviews in Chicago and a few other cities, um, but it was exactly right. And also, I believe in, you know, really um, deriving your inspiration from where you are. And, you know, I, I do live in Nashville. I mean, I, I'm pretty active in the community. Um, I'm, I'm usually out and about. I'm a very social person. And so 
I kept after my first book came out meeting more and more amazing people and realized, yes, wow, I think I barely scratched the surface of this city. And so I felt like not only to do Nashville justice, um, but also there were more people that I really felt like I wanted to sit down with and learn their stories. Yeah. So are there, you know, a couple of stories from the book that really stood out to you as as people that were, you know, remarkable, that were doing cool things that the, their story really needed to be told? Absolutely. I would say um, first and foremost, and I, I thought about um, him the other day because he actually a lot of the subjects have been stopping by, you know, my loft downtown to pick up copies of the new book. Michael Fisher, he's a sergeant and what they call a community affairs officer. So in essence, he's a cop. I felt like he was such an important person to interview, not only because, you know, as we all know, police officers have gotten such a bad rap in the last couple of years, but he is just a really incredible individual. And I loved his insights, which everyone can read about in my new book about listening and communication and empathy and you know, I mean, he really broke down how as a cop, you know, he he uses all of those skills in order to, I mean, basically help people get along in the community. And I just thought not only was that so moving, but it was really pragmatic as well. Yeah, that's that's such a great story. How do you go about how did you find him? How do you go about, you know, picking the people for the book? You know, um, I, it really is by word of mouth. Uh, either it's one subject telling me about another really incredible person that they're either, you know, friends with or sometimes related to, um, you know, or they know from the community. Um, or it's just a random friend, um, a guy that I had worked with on a mural project last year, Jake Elliott, who is a painter in town. I'm, I'm friends with him and his wife, Hannah. They're really incredible people and very involved in the arts community in Nashville. He had suggested Michael. He think he just shot me a text message one day and said, you know, I, I think that you would really find him interesting and he's just an incredibly wonderful human being. I, I know you guys would hit it off like gangbusters. And so if it's someone who I, I trust their opinion, then I absolutely will trust the referral as well. Yeah, that well, that makes sense. Uh, I love that. And it feels more organic, you know, like nothing is forced. It's, it's like the people are, you're supposed to find the people and the people are supposed to find you. Yes. And I like to think like attracts like. And so, you know, I think that there's something about and I know this gets into kind of like woo woo sort of stuff, but I do think there's <laughs> something about my subjects. Um, You know, we probably have a lot of very similar, you know, qualities and a lot of commonalities. And so and, and I agree. I, I love I'm not into things being orchestrated. Like I've never been someone that really enjoyed being pitched by publish this, you know, can you interview the person that I represent? I would rather walk into a grocery store and bump into someone, you know, in the checkout line and say, holy crap, you know, you're incredible. Do you want to be on my blog? That I, I, And what I love about that is that, you know, I think I'm always trying to do this on the podcast to to share stories about people and it's particularly their money story because I think when we hear about other people's you know different things maybe they've gone through and different money lessons they've learned like there's a connection like oh I'm not that much different than that person but I think you know what's so great about what you just said is really like you're showing that everybody has a story like you don't have to be you know a famous person or have a million bucks in your bank account to have lived a really worthy life or to be doing cool things in your community. And I think we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit, you know, really just talking to people and hearing what their story is and, and finding that common ground where we can connect and relate to them. I think so. And I think another thing I try to do in my interviews is, you know, even though I talk to people about their jobs, I would say I focus more heavily on their insights rather than the actual technicalities of their job. Um, you know, I, I think I and I thought about this a lot when I was, you know, in the UK last year, because like I said, I spent a lot of time there. Um, you know, people in um, Americans really, we very much define ourselves by what we do, which is great. And I mean, you know, I, I'm very proud of the fact, you know, that I'm an author and a writer. Um, but it's also not completely who I am. And so I like to show sort of the depth and the breadth of my subjects by talking about 
their thoughts, their insight, you know, uh, some of their favorite experiences. And a lot of times, I mean, even going outside of the realm of their job, I think it's important to show sort of the 360 degree angle of everyone. For sure. All right. So is there is there another story that really popped out to you in the book? I well, you know, there's an organization in town called Thistle Farms. Um, they are a wonderful organization based in West Nashville. And basically it is a rehabilitation center for women who've, you know, been victims of, you know, either drug addiction or sex trafficking. And so when I had initially written them down on my list for my second book as an organization that I wanted to highlight, you know, of course, the initial thought was we'll interview the founder, Reverend Becca Stevens. And very quickly, I realized, no, I'd rather interview someone who actually went through the program. Um, you know, interviewing the founder is great, just like interviewing the CEO of a company is wonderful. But I think I'm more interested in the people who do the day to day sort of work. And so I was just absolutely floored by this woman. Um, first of all, she actually read me a really beautiful poem that she wrote during the interview, which I mean, I'm a crier anyway, so it's not unusual for me <laughs> to get emotional. Um, but you know, it moved me to tears. And also, I mean, the whole ethos behind our conversation was how healing love can be. You know, I mean, she, she had gone through so much in her life and now that she's in this community full of, you know, women and men, um, you know, who are very supportive of one another on an emotional level. I mean, she, she said it. She said, you know, I, I feel like it healed me from all the mistakes that I made in the past. And um, that to me was just it was really touching. It was a story that I felt like, especially in our political climate these days, I wanted to tell. That's a great one. Yeah, that it's just so powerful. Um, so, I mean, I wish that the person listening to this podcast could actually, like, there was a visual version of this that they could actually see what the book looks like because it's not just a book. Like, it's one of those books that, you know, could sit on your coffee table that you can come back to often, read stories over and over again, you know, get inspired. Uh, walk me through a little bit, you know, how did you decide to design the book this way? Uh, you have some amazing uh, pictures of these subjects in the book, you know, how did you come up with that whole feel of this? Sure. So, you know, um, I think that, you know, on my first book, my designer, Benjamin Rumble, who I've worked with for several years now, who's brilliant in my eyes, he and I worked together really hard to create, you know, an aesthetic, which, you know, would feature the black and white photography and really make it pop. Um, you know, I think sort of the hallmarks um, aesthetically of my brand are the pull quotes and these really, you know, intimate sort of striking black and white photographs. Um, and then, of course, you know, what's instrumental in the creation of the books is my photographers. I worked with four wonderful photographers on my first book. Um, this second one, Word of Mouth, More Conversations. I worked with a gentleman named Ron Manville, who is quite a bit older than me. He's 70. Um, and so, you know, I, I felt like that was such um, an asset uh, to my brand. You know, I oftentimes interview people who are twice my age. And so I loved the idea of having someone who was a little bit older, who maybe the subjects would feel, um, you know, comfortable with. Um, Ron also is a legend in the culinary world. You know, he, he's shot 70 plus cookbooks. And so he began his career with portrait photography, um, but he hadn't done it in quite some time. So, you know, as he writes in one of the three forewords in the book, he was so excited um, to begin doing portrait photography again, which I thought was not only so cool because he was kind of starting over at a point in his life when most people would honestly maybe be retiring, um, but also he had this very, um, special sort of childlike enthusiasm. You know, I mean, he's similar to me. I mean, he would read up on the subjects and think very deeply about how he wanted to shoot them. And I mean, he just puts an incredible amount of thought and detail into his photos. And I think it shows. That's so cool. I love that. I love when people can reignite a passion. I think you're never too young or too old to embrace something uh, that you love. And, uh, you know, you can definitely feel his e essence in the book, you know, in those pictures, like you, they feel so intimate, like you're, you're meeting that person, which, you know, I know is definitely what you wanted to portray, but it, it 
definitely it comes across that way and and it's a really unique uh it's just a special feel to the book. So, you know, at this point, you've done well over a thousand interviews over your career. You know, where do you see the art of conversation going in the future? Is there a reason to feel hopeful that maybe we're going to, you know, connect with people on a deeper level? Or do you think that, you know, technology maybe is is pulling us backwards? I feel hopeful. I mean, as my therapist uh, put it, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, <laughs> she said, wow, you're a real optimist. I said, I think I am. I mean, you know, I, I've always been a glass half full kind of person and uh, I like to see the best in the world and in people. And I think that people are craving face to face connection more than ever. And so, you know, I, I got an email actually yesterday from one of my subjects. I was really touched by it. If he's listening, I'm sorry, I haven't responded yet. <laughs> but, um, you know, he said, uh, you know, I, I would love for you to do one of your live interviews at um, my new coffee shop. It's supposed to be a place for conversation. And I just think the amount of time that people spend on their phones or social media or computers, um, I think that we're going to revert very quickly, if not, you know, at this moment back to wanting to you know, just having a good old chat. I mean, you know, and, and I always joke about that in my interviews. I mean, I think some of the interviews in my new book are actually quite funny. I mean, I, I think I, uh, I'm actually a pretty lighthearted person, um, you know, at heart. And I don't think that, you know, conversations, they don't have to be a drag. They don't have to be, you know, super heavy. Um, I just think that we need to spend more time getting to know one another. And, um, so yes, I, I, I hope, and again, I would encourage people to, you know, go to the bar or the pub or the coffee shop or, you know, your local sort of tech center like I do at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center and just say hi to the person sitting next to you and don't be afraid. Great advice. So, uh, Lily, tell the listeners where they can go to find out more about you, to get to know you better, and also where they can go to uh, pick up a copy of the book if they're interested. Absolutely. So, you know, I have made the decision in the last month that um, I'm going to begin with selling my book, um, you know, direct to consumers. So you can buy my book on www.wordofmouthconversations.com. Um, it's it's super simple there. You'll just go to the buy book page and, you know, you just add it to your shopping cart and I will ship out a, you know, personalized copy to you for probably the day of. Um, or if you live in Nashville, I'm also offering a local pickup option. So my email address is on the website. You can just email me directly and we'll arrange a time to meet in person. And, you know, there's there's tons more information about the book and my brand on my website as well. So head on over to the show notes to check out all the links for Lily Hansen's books to pick up a book yourself, and to find out more about the conversations. As always, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Shauna Game. And if you love this podcast, do me a favor, share it with your friends, shout it out on social media, and head on over to that little link in the show notes to leave us a review. 